You know, we talk a lot about influencer marketing software on this show. And the worst thing about it for a lot of you is that influencer marketing software for small businesses is too expensive, right? Well, Reach Influencers solves that problem. Now your small business can find, engage, and manage micro and nano influencers, the ones you can afford to work with. And Reach Influencers costs as low as $100 per month. Are you kidding me? No, it's true. Go to CaptureTheInfluence.com slash podcast and see for yourself. Find, engage, manage, influence with software built and priced for your sized business. CaptureTheInfluence.com slash podcast. On this episode of Winfluence. Think about how your community can not only serve you, but can serve all the people inside of it to connect with others. If they like and if they look up to you as somebody that has a sense of influence, that has a sense of impact, they have something in common. And I bet they can get a lot of value from connecting with each other. At my parties, I use something called guest bios, which is a brief feature or highlight about the people attending the party. How can you do that for your community? There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Let's talk about building your influence. And no, I don't mean growing your follower count on social networks. I mean really growing the number of people that you have some degree of persuasion or influence over. Now, for some of you, you'll want to build a following online or offline and have true influence. Perhaps you want to be a content creator that does brand deals and gets paid to create on social media channels. Or maybe you have political aspirations, or you just see the value in growing your audience or network that you have an impact upon. Others of you probably see the value in growing the influence your business has, perhaps over prospective customers. But more specific to what we talk about on this show, maybe you want to grow your influence over the influencers in your space. When you remove the guardrails of influencer marketing and stop focusing solely on follower counts and social networks online, you start to see true influence. That is often built offline, face-to-face, at events. Think of it as networking, not social networking, which now seems to imply online. When I happen to stumble upon a person, brand, case study, or resource that can help me explain and emphasize the offline part of influence marketing without the R, I latch onto it. And I recently found one such resource. Nick Gray is an entrepreneur that you could say was an original influencer. He started a website and company on the side in the mid-2000s called Museum Hack. He did what he calls renegade tours of the Met and similar museums in New York City at first, then around the world. The content exploded and Museum Hack became a full-fledged business with 50 employees. He sold it in 2019. Nick's climb to the top of the entrepreneurial success ladder, however, sprouted from a socially awkward kid who moved to New York City in his early 20s. The way he networked and grew his influence inspired a now five-year-long project that resulted in a book. It's called The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Big Relationships with Small Gatherings. Nick and I caught up recently to talk about his book, The Idea of Hosting Cocktail Parties to Grow Your Local and Community Influence, and how the ideas in the book can help content creators and brands alike become more influential, not just leverage influence or influencers. More from Nick in a moment. As always, we have to thank our presenting sponsor, Tagger. One of the headaches many influence marketing practitioners have is pulling all the data from their influence partner's content. Instagram stories are particularly frustrating. If you don't have a tool like Tagger, you often have to ask the influencer to screenshot their insights, which they do on their phone. Inevitably, part of the report screens are cut off or omitted. It makes for a lot of extra manual work to show results. With Tagger, you give your creators a hashtag to use in their content. You give them a link to authorize Tagger to read their insights automatically, and reporting happens automatically, including Instagram stories. I could go on, but you know I use it. You should check it out, too. 
It might be right for your brand or agency. Go to jason.online slash tagger to get a free demo and see if tagger is right for you. That URL is jason.online slash tagger. We're going to talk about hosting a cocktail party for neighbors, friends, or even members of your community you don't know real well, all to grow your influence. Entrepreneur and author Nick Gray is next on Winfluence. Support for Winfluence and all the shows in the Marketing Podcast Network is provided by Storyblock. Think of your content management system. Now think of it being able to update the other 5, 10, or even 20 places you need those prices or product descriptions changed. Update content once, publish it everywhere. Sign up for a free account to see how simple content management can be. Go to storyblock.com slash Winfluence. That's storyblock without the C dot com slash Winfluence. Nick, the premise of my book and, frankly, this podcast is to expand how people think about influencers and influencer marketing. One of the ways we do that is we explore offline influence, which is exactly why I wanted to have you on the show. You have written a book that helps people build their influence. Now, that's not the way I think you would describe the book, but I look at things through that lens. So that's my takeaway. Why don't you tell folks what your book is about? I love that idea of influence because think about it. You have influence amongst your friends, your neighbors, your work colleagues. Our circle of influence isn't just our followers online. And so I'm obsessed with that. I wrote a book that teaches you how to host a two-hour cocktail party for your friends, neighbors, acquaintances, loose connections. I can talk about that later, about building influence amongst your acquaintances and how important that is. But that's the gist of it. I'll start there. That's great. So this is essentially a book on how to host a party. I'm going to get to uh, to a stronger connection between this book and influencer marketing as we go along here. But let's go through some of the mechanics here first. First of all, why would people want to host a party? Uh, and why do you think a book like this is needed? Here's the gist. Most Americans haven't made a new friend in real life in over three years. COVID has been hard on us. It was hard on me. and I lost contact with a lot of people. People are awkward. They forget how to gather right now, how to make small talk. I've written an extremely tactical and practical book that shows you how to have a successful event, not just for you, but for everyone who attends. And here's why it makes sense. This book helps your friends make new friends. So Mm -hmm. everyone who comes to this party, there's activities involved. And I promise they're not too corny, (laughs) but they they just help people make new conversations. Because you ever go to a party and you're like, God, who am I supposed to talk to? This is awkward. Like what? I'm just going to bump into somebody. My parties have name tags. There's three quick rounds of icebreakers. We use these things called guest bios. So you know who's coming. That's the general gist, Jason. Very good. All right. So your book goes through the basics to start off, which includes the the why, which you covered. You also talk about when, where, who to invite, and the magic, as you put it, and as you mentioned, of name tags. Now, for those out there kind of gobbling this up to build their local neighborhood and community influence, take us through those when, where, and who do you invite, and then give us the razzle-dazzle on the name tags thing. Great. So I'll start with when, and here's the counterintuitive advice. If you're hosting a party, you need to only host it on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night. Whoa. Okay. Why? Well, the reason why is that most Friday, Saturday nights are socially competitive. Mm -hmm. People have activities. They have family. They have kids. They have stuff going on. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, are generally non-competitive days. They're what I call green level days. And the number one fear for people about hosting a party is that most pe- that nobody's going to show up, yeah. right? And so, so much of my book is building in that over 90% of the people who say that they're going to come are going to come to your party. And there's things that I do to make sure that happens. So that's when you should host your party. Now, the where is a little controversial, and I want to hear your feedback to it, but the where is, I believe very strongly that you should host this at your home. Okay. Now- I don't yes, have thought. any I don't have any objections to that but I'm also an, kind of an extrovert social butterfly kind of guy. Yeah. But I know people like my girlfriend who is rather introverted and you know kind of adverse to people from from time to time 
that would send her anxiety through the roof if she yes. were to have to host something. So for those types of folks who say, oh, there's no way in hell I'm not hosting it in my house. Well, right. what's, your, what's your counter to that? Well, the one, that's exactly right. You and I may be kind of extroverts, but introverts, as we think about it, a lot of the party planning that I've done helps them to feel more safe and more comfortable. And they actually generally do feel more safe at home. But let me say this, because people listening to this are most interested in influence, oftentimes we project an image of ourselves that is different from how we actually live. And I'll give you an example. When I was in New York City, I projected this huge image. And the reality was I had a multi-million dollar business but also I lived in a small studio apartment, Mm -hmm. okay? And so the image of myself, perhaps in my real life, might not have been this big, you know, penthouse apartment guy. But I'll tell you this, when you invite someone into your home, it is more vulnerable, it is more raw, it is more authentic, and it serves to create the connection and the bond that you want to make. Nobody's going to show up to your house and say, what? This tiny little apartment, I'm out of here. This person stinks. No, they're not going to show up and judge you. You're bringing them into your home. You're being generous. You're being welcoming. It's just a much, I, this is a hill that I will die on. That and name tag, <laughs> you should host it at home. <laughs> All right, before we get to name tags real quick, something I thought of as you were answering that is for those of you out there on the brand side who are listening today, I'm thinking that there's a lot of correlations here to hosting a kind of a meetup at your business for the influencers in your area that can physically come there. So if you're looking to connect with local influencers, have an influencer night, have a party for them to come to the office and have some cocktails and maybe follow all the tips in this book from Nick so that you can, you know, make relationships with them. This works perfectly for hosting a happy hour at work for your clients, your customers, your potential customers, because it uses this formula, this formula, which I call the Nick party formula, N-I-C-K. That stands for N stands for name tags. I stands for icebreakers. And these icebreakers are important because you want other people to meet people Mm -hmm. so that you are seen as the connector. Oh, where'd you guys meet? We met at Jason's cocktail party. Right. right. You're going to be seen as this influencer. So N I C K N for name tags. I for icebreaker. C is cocktails only. Don't get a don't get ahead of yourself. Don't try to make this a dinner party. Ah, Trust me. Okay. By doing a cocktail party, you can get 80 percent of the benefits of a dinner party with 20 percent of the work. <laughs> you can invite more people. You can stress less. It's uh-huh. good. It's good. And then K stands for kick them out at the end. This is only a <laughs> two hour party. <laughs> I like that. And so that actually helps mitigate some of the anxiety that people are going to have. The introverts who don't want to, I don't want people in my house. I don't want them touching things. I don't want to have yeah. to clean up. You know, the, I, I like the the containment of it all. That makes a lot of sense. And that's why we host on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, because this yeah. we all have work or school or something the next day. This isn't a blowout, get wasted event. In fact, I don't even drink alcohol. There's no alcohol recipes in this book. But we use that phrase cocktail party because it connotates a social gathering that's easy to hop into with a lot of small conversations. Yeah. That's a lot less intimidating than somebody to say, oh, do you want to come to my dinner party? It's like, man, I'm locked in. That's three hours. I got a schedule. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that's smart. All right. Real quickly, before we get to the name tags, who do you invite to, to, to run us through that checklist? Well, for your first party and a lot of your listeners I know are like a type, you know, power people. I'm going to advise them. Your first party, do not invite the VIPs. What do I mean by that? Do not invite the big client you're trying to win, the new relationship you want to build, your brand new girlfriend that you're dying to impress. (laughs) Do not do that. Your first party using these methods that I suggest needs to be a low stakes affair. So who are you inviting? You're inviting your college classmates. You're inviting your old roommates. You're inviting the colleagues that you work with that you sit with at lunch. These are people that will laugh at your jokes, show up on time, and make you look good. Your neighbors, perhaps. Use this first party that my book will walk you through to learn like a party operating system. 
for how you can learn to host regular happy hours that'll be successful. So that's for the first one. After you get the foundation, then you can start reaching out and building your network using these parties. Growing your influence truly can happen by hosting these live events, but it also works in virtual like you and I were talking about, Jason. Yeah. And we're going to, we'll dive into a little bit deeper into that in, in a minute. All right. I got, I got to come back to the name tags. Cause if you're going to start off with N being your first thing, uh, I, 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 when I come into an event, even a conference and they make you fill out your own name tag, I write somebody else's name on it. Oh just, no. Just for the hell of it. So oh, no. Tell me, tell me how you should employ them and, and why I'm an idiot. Jason, you are, <laughs> I'm sending you to the remedial name tag school. <laughs> I'm sending you to that school. So I know why you do that. You do that because you have a sense of humor and you like to joke about it, right? But as we're talking about these introverted people, these shy people, by removing that barrier of trying to ask them to remember somebody's name, it makes it easier for us to engage. Name tags also show visually that everybody's on the same team. This is a safe space to start up a new conversation. This isn't a party where there's cliques and best friends who are only talking to each other. When you wear a name tag, that gives someone the permission to come up and say hello and talk to you. And that's what I'm trying to encourage with these parties. That's what I do encourage after hosting hundreds of these to build my own network and launch my company. Awesome. All right. So we've got the basics down here. Now we've got to make it all happen. What are the logistics to throwing this two hour cocktail party that people need to remember? The biggest logistics you need to remember is to invite your guests one to one. You're sending individual invitations. Now, even before you cast a wide net, you're getting five people who will say yes, that they can come. That's how you'll know. You'll almost do a soft launch of your date and time. Say that Jason was one of my good friends. I would say, Jason, I'm thinking of hosting a a cocktail party at my house in three weeks on Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Do you think you could make it? You wait until you get five of those yeses. Then you create a page to collect people's RSVPs and you further get them to commit with a simple online RSVP that shows social proof. Now their name is on the page, they've committed. And when you share the invite to others, because has this ever happened to you, Jason? You see a Facebook event, it's like three people attending and 97 have been invited. (laughs) Yeah, I've seen those before, for sure. (laughs) And that's the worst, right? We don't want to do that. So all your invites, you're going to do one-to-one. The other logistics are pretty easy, but I will say that I ask people to send three reminder messages One that comes uh, about a week before, the next one comes four days before, and then the other one comes the morning of. What are we doing? We're keeping our event top of mind. Again, it's just to know that everybody's going to come to your party. The more people, the more fun. By the way, this party, the numbers I'm thinking are 15 to 20 people. That's it. Your listeners are overachievers. They're going to be like, I'm going to invite the whole city. No, (laughs) you will end up in surrounded by pizza crust and empty beer bottles. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. And Uh, I can tell you, I I have about a 2000 square foot house. Of course, I don't live in a big city, so I I have a little bit more space, but I have a 2000 square foot house. And a couple of years ago for my son's eighth grade graduation, I had 50 people in my house and that was about 15 more than it could comfortably hold. So (laughs) fortunately we had good weather and everything sort of spilled out into the backyard, but at the same time, yeah, don't go crazy on having people in your house folks, because that will make it way more stressful than it needs to be. More stressful. So your book finally has some very handy advice for how to navigate the party. This section of the book is super valuable for those introverts, the people who get a little tongue tied or stage fright when they meet new people. Give us a couple of those icebreakers and navigation tips for the actual event. So I'll talk about an icebreaker first. I'll tell you why we do it and I'll tell you what I use. Why do we use an icebreaker? It's not that the answer to the icebreaker is groundbreaking. All I'm looking for is a spark to give someone the excuse to start a conversation when the icebreaker is over. I want to give people excuses to go talk to somebody new. The icebreaker that I use, Jason, every time to start my parties and the one I've tested with 55 other people reading my book to host their first party is say your name, 
Say what you do for work. If you don't want to talk about work, then something you're excited about. And here's the last part. Say what your what one of your favorite things to eat for breakfast is. <laughs> Okay. (laughs) Now I'll tell you why that works. Now that's simple, right? You may say this is childish. We did that in third grade, but a good icebreaker one is a fast icebreaker. Somebody doesn't need to think and ponder again, coming back to the introverts, the shy people, we don't want them to stress about their answer Two, everybody eats breakfast or decides not to eat breakfast if they do intermittent fasting. And three, inner breakfast is like, it generally has positive memories and it shows a little bit of our personality. If somebody says that they like to eat a bowl of blueberries, then maybe I'd ask them about healthy food. If they say they love waffles covered in syrup, maybe I'm going to ask them about health or not healthy, but I'm going to ask them about delicious breakfast options in town. Mm-hmm. All right. I like that. That's good and simple. All right. We've heard the high level uh, from Nick on how to host a party, which is super useful for a lot of reasons, but certainly for building your own local community or other small circles of influence. When we come back, I want to have Nick take us through how that might translate online to stay tuned, everybody. Hey gang, LinkedIn is number one in B2B display advertising in the U.S. And using LinkedIn advertising gives you a great advantage. You can stand out against your competitors while nurturing customer relationships and growing your brand. LinkedIn's targeting tools allow you to reach your precise audience down to their job title, company name, location, and more. That means your ads are being seen by those who matter. Scale your marketing, grow your business with LinkedIn advertising. As a thank you to their customers for helping them grow three times faster than the competition and just for listening to Winfluence, LinkedIn is offering a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash Winfluence. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence just for you to claim that credit. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. A hundred bucks in free ads? I'm down. Okay, we've learned how to throw a party from Nick Gray. His new book is called The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Relationships with Small Gatherings. It is available now. We'll give you the URLs and all that stuff toward the end of the show. Nick, uh, well, uh, let's do it now. Nick, where can people get on the list to find out about the book or where can they find the book and buy it and all that good stuff? Give us that now. You got to check out, I built a whole microsite with all these articles and everything from the book. The address is www.party, P-A-R-T-Y, dot pro, P-R-O, www.party.pro. And then I have a website too that's got my blog and my friend's newsletter. That's nickgray, G-R-A-Y, dot net, N-E-T. And then the book's for sale on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, on Apple Books, all these places. Fantastic. So party.pro. I like that. That's a hell of a URL. Love those. All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, but in a good way, Nick, because all I kept thinking as I read this book was all of this translates to online. Now, yep. this could this could be a subtext on how to host a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group or a clubhouse chat or a Twitter spaces chat. Now, sure, there are some factors to consider to adjust, I'm sure, but I'm curious if you thought about your ideas here in terms of online as you were writing this. Absolutely. And I'm going to give you a couple of the tips from my real world events that I've hosted through hundreds of gatherings. And I'll tell you exactly what you can use for online communities. So number one, this probably is obvious, but one-to-one invites. Similarly, when you invite somebody to join your community and come to your world, you want to do that through a DM. And that's where you're most engaged with them. Is it on Instagram? Then send them a DM. Is it on Twitter? Is it on Facebook Messenger? Maybe it's on text or it's on email. But we're not going to blast that out to people. So that's one. The second thing is think about how your community can not only serve you, but can serve all the people inside of it to connect with others. If they like and if they look up to you as somebody that has a sense of influence that has a sense of impact, they have something in common. And I bet they can get a lot of value from connecting with each other. At my parties, I use something called guest bios, which is a brief feature or highlight about the people attending the party. 
How can you do that for your community? Featuring your members every week to say who else is there and shining a light on how awesome the members of your community are. I'm just going to pause to see if that resonates with you, Jason. It absolutely does. And, you know, when I think about the people, uh, the communities that I'm involved with and the techniques that I've observed people who build really good communities, uh, the things that they do, like when, um, you know, a company has... Um, you know, they, they like to highlight their customers, which is kind of the same concept. Or I know Mark Schaefer is a, a digital marketing, you know, expert guy who has a really vibrant community at Businesses Grow. And he routinely will come on LinkedIn and post, you know, pictures of him, uh, you know, meeting some of the people in his community o- offline. Like he had, you know, coffee with this person in Seattle that has been a longtime reader and fan of his and he met them in person. And so it's uplifting those individuals. Um, within the, the the communities that I've seen other people build and the communities that, that I've been involved with, I actually try, um, and, and we've had some modest success with it here on, on the podcast, because I think of the listeners of this show as a community and, and my community, the people who come here to listen to what I have to say or what the, the guests that I bring on have to say. And I, at the end of every show, I invite people, hey, if you've got a question or if you've got you know some, something about influence marketing you want my answer to or take on, record a voice memo and send it to me and I'll let you actually ask the question using your own voice right here on the show. I'll edit it into the show. I've had a couple of people take advantage of that so far. I'm trying to encourage more of that, but everything you're saying absolutely has this like mirror activity through community building and community management online. So really, really smart stuff. So I like that idea. The last one and by the way, if you haven't already submitted a voice question to Jason, why don't you go ahead and do that now? Because it does. It enriches it. And this is a community of listeners. If you're listening to this show, you're unique and you're special and you've self-selected to be part of this group. The last thing I'll just say is I run something called a friend's newsletter and I share personal photos of myself in that. We all have a business newsletter. We all have business communications I run a personal one that's for my close friends, and it's a newsletter that I would just send to my friends. I send it out infrequently, not on a schedule, just when I have something cool to share. And that could be a great Netflix show or a movie that I watch, an incredible book that I read. And I include a little more candid photos and something like that. And it's helped me to create a sense of authenticity and almost like super fans among my friends. That's awesome. And for those of you who are are content creators out there, I want to speak specifically to you because the next level, I think, for influencers and content creators is having this sort of closed door almost sense of private community with your biggest fans. And the ideas that come out of Nick's book are all ideas that I can see an influencer or a content creator employing to A, bring a community of people together, B, identify the ones who are going to keep coming back and keep being involved so that you know, hey, you know what? I can build a fans only or only fans. They're both you know, they're interchangeable. They're the same types of sites, but they're competitors. I can have a private subscription-based social network that I invite 50 people into, and they're willing to pay to have that level of engagement with me. So the, these are all ideas that even though... Nick's purpose here, I think, is much more organic and authentic to building friendships and relationships. They're, the strategies and tactics that he shares in this book are great for content creators in building that you know sense of ardent fans, the fans that separate, the super fans that separate themselves from the rest of the people who follow you. So there's lots of great tips and tricks in here. Because that's what your fans want who subscribe to your super fan, to your only fans to your premium on Twitter, they want that behind the scenes. They want that authenticity. Just like you're inviting someone into your home to host a cocktail party, you're inviting your super fans to look behind the curtains to see a little bit more about you. Well, uh, one one last question before we, we wrap it up here, Nick. I want to make sure I go back to the concept of the icebreakers. And uh, please tell me that online icebreakers uh, are are not... Uh, what what you eat for breakfast. <laughs> They're not necessarily what you eat for <laughs> breakfast. I'll tell you this, for your listeners, a question that I always ask at the end of my party, once I've built some rapport with people, is what's a great piece of media 
that you've consumed in the last couple months. That could be a book, a podcast, a Netflix show, a long form article, or even a great quote that you read. Similarly, online, you've probably seen this, Jason. This is just fire. When people ask, what's one of the best purchases you've made under $100? Mm -hmm. I see people engaging. And why is that? Well, one, they love to share the products that they love. And two, they love to find out about new products. So asking those types of questions, that's not rocket science. This is 101 of online engagement for your audience, but it does work. I'm telling you, man, you've got a, an easy sequel to this book, you know, doing the two hour online cocktail party. You've got book number two right there waiting for you, teed up and ready to go. Uh, Nick, remind us again where people can get the book and where they can subscribe to your newsletter and find all your good stuff. The name of the book is The Two-Hour Cocktail Party. If you're listening and you want a one-page PDF of exactly how to host a party and what you need to do to prepare, then you can send me an email, uh, nick at um, party.pro. That's nick at party.pro. Or visit my website, www.party.pro. Awesome. Good stuff. Nick Gray, thanks for being here and helping us shine the light on a bit of that offline influence too. Good stuff, man. Thanks, Jason. Awesome stuff. Nick is such a fun guy to talk to, and the book is really, really useful. Go to party.pro and or nickgray.net. That's N-I-C-K-G-R-A-Y.net. Or search for the two-hour cocktail party on Amazon. I'll make sure there's a quick link to all that in the show notes of this episode at jasonfalls.com. If you go to that website, jasonfalls.com, just click on articles at the top there, and it'll take you to all the posts, including the podcast episodes. Don't forget to drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We're on all of them, I think. Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Podchaser, TuneIt, Good Pods, Listen Notes, Audible, Pandora, Amazon Music. If we're not where you listen, let me know. I will correct that as soon as possible. Whatever your app or listening mode, if you're listening to us right now, and this may come as a shock to you, you are. Look for the stars or ratings on that app or site and tap or click to let us know how we're doing. Also. If you'd like a deep dive on influencer marketing topics every so often, subscribe to my email newsletter at jason.online slash subscribe. I send it every four to six weeks. I go deep on a topic to make your influence marketing smarter. I am working on the next one still. Should be coming out this week. So go sign up at jason.online slash subscribe and get on that list. That's jason.online slash subscribe. And I'd love for you to help make a future episode of Winfluence awesome, just like Nick and I talked in the episode. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Send an email to jason at jasonfalls.com. If you're feeling adventurous and you want me to highlight you as a member of our Winfluence community here, record a voice memo on your phone and email me that file. I'll let you ask the question right here on the show using the recording. Regardless of how you ask it, I may use your comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. I'm Ian Truscott here to tell you about Rockstar CMO FM. The M is the marketing and the F is the well you decide. As you wonder, does the world need another effing marketing podcast? Find out as every week I chat with friends old and new that I've met through my career from techie to CMO and share a tune, a cocktail and their marketing street knowledge. Just drop a dime into your podcasting jukebox.